Hi. Uh, thanks for coming tonight, guys. Um, I know everybody's pressed for time, but um, it's an important thing uh, that we want to try and get across to everybody um, on nutrition. Pete's the man to do it. Um, anything you want to know about supplements, um, bits and pieces that you need to take to enhance your trading performance, um, your everyday life, um, any questions you've got, um, Pete's the dude to do it. Okay. So, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for having it's all me. yours. Hi guys, my name's Pete and I'm from Nutrition Warehouse. Uh, my background is food science, uh, with a bit of dabble in dietetics. Now, with supplements, um, I've been working in the industry for about 12 years now, uh, ever since the GNC days, so I used to be from GNC. Um, I spent about a good four or five years with them and then I moved on to this company, Nutrition Warehouse, it's been really, really good to me. Uh, today I'm going to discuss a few things here, uh, I'm going to keep it pretty simple. Um, I'm going to talk about how protein works in conjunction with your diet and your training, what are amino acids, uh, how do they work, and of course your favorite fat burners. Okay. Um, I'm going to discuss whether or not it's applicable for your training, um, you know, if you can use it, if you're young, old, doesn't matter, uh, how it works with your diet as well, and what roles they play on your day-to-day -day, uh, diet. Okay, um, and I'll leave the question, question Q and A's to the end of the session. Now, the first thing I'm going to start off with protein. Okay, protein powders. I'm going to show you uh, two or three things with them. What to look for in a protein powder. So let's just say if you just walk into a random supplement shop in the middle of America and you can see all these protein powders, you guys have probably probably have heard of brands like Optimum Nutrition, EHP Labs. The list goes on. So there's about probably more brands than I can count. Now. I probably encountered or sold at least 80% of the brands out there, um, and they're all the same. Okay, there's not really much difference. The only difference is, is the protein percentages and the types of protein they use. So we'll let's break that down. Okay, now protein powders come in two different types. The ones we consider very specific ones, so ones for after training, which we call whey protein isolates. So the three main common ones that you're going to come across is whey protein isolate whey protein concentrate and casein. So those are the only three that you really need to remember. Okay, now what are the difference between those three? Your isolates will digest the fastest. Okay, uh, quickest emptying rate, quickest breakdown rate. And when we say breakdown, uh, we're talking about the conversion of the actual protein itself into usable amino acids. So that's how they work. Okay, we don't really use protein, we use amino acids. That's what the blood uh, transfers to our muscles, hair, skin, nails, organs. That's what we're. That's what. That's the usable thing. It's just like your body doesn't really use oranges. It uses the vitamin C it gets from it, or it doesn't use the fructose. It gets the vitamin C out of it. Okay. So higher the yield of protein and the lower the carb, generally means more amino acids you're going to get per hundred grams. So generally we have only a certain amount of calories we can expend per day. So let's just say um, if I ask you here to consume ten thousand calories a day, it's just physically not feasible. So What's realistic, maybe about 1,500 calories, okay? Um, not trying to guess your weight or anything, but let's just say this, um, this lady can only consume 1,500 calories of food a day, so she's got to be very careful what she consumes. Obviously, there are some foods that are higher in protein uh, than others, and certain ones that are very, very, very low in protein. Um, so what I mean by that is uh, you're only going to get a certain amount of amino acids per meal or per protein shake, okay? So... Back to the topic about the amino acids, uh, what are amino acids? They're basically uh, nutrients that our body uses for certain uh, functions, like for example, we have branched amino acids, which are responsible for muscle growth and muscle recovery. That's pretty much the limitations that they use. They do help a bit of a hair growth, um, but it's not in a way where, you know, if you're balding, I can take a lot of BCAAs and it's going to make my hair grow back. It doesn't work like that. It does make your hair grow faster than normal, but if it's thinning, it's going to stay that same way, okay? So if you are extra sore, branching amino acids are very good to use, That's, which is this one here, okay? Um, it breaks up into certain other things like essential amino acids and non-essential, which are just good for general health and that sort of stuff. Um, but we're going to focus on what to look for in a protein and how it works for us and how it's going to benefit us in our training and our diet, okay? So out of those proteins, isolate, concentrate, and casein, which one's the best one to use? All of them are, okay? They're just like our food group, each one serves a function. Now, your concentrates and caseins are gonna taste the best because they're thick, they're creamy, they're tasty, and 
very, very uh, usable in terms of like cooking. Uh, you can mix it into smoothies. It's going to give you more thickness, uh, more more fulfillness. Uh, sorry, it's going to fill you up a lot more in terms of your palate. Okay. Because isolates generally digest faster, they're suitable for people with lactose issues. So if you've got a really rumbly stomach every time you have meat or dairy or whatever, isolates are the best one to go with because they break down very, very fast, uh, get the amino acids quick into your muscles, so they're ideal for post-workout. But like I said, with the breakdown rate, uh, the quick breakdown rate, it comes at a cost. So if you were to use them as meal replacements, they're not that ideal, okay? Now your concentrates and your casein, very, very um, versatile. So very versatile for anything you want to use for. You can use them for post-workout, you can use them for meal replacements, cooking, uh, before bed because they've got such a slow breakdown rate. Casein is the best, you know, anywhere between four to eight hours of breakdown. Uh, so it's slow, sustained release of amino acids. It's very good for before bed, especially if you get those night cravings. Casein is very, very good. They'll keep you full for a long time um, without offering you as much calories or full, offering the same amount of calories as the isolate concentrate um, and any other protein. So generally across the board, uh, if I use isolate as opposed to casein or concentrate, will I lose more weight? The answer is no. They all cost four calories per gram of protein. Okay, protein is protein. You could get protein from goat's milk, from camel's milk, they're all going to be four calories per gram. Okay, the only difference is, is the breakdown rate. So for someone who's trying to lose weight, you're essentially trying to limit or reduce the amount of calories you consume per day, okay, while keeping your appetite almost the same or reducing your appetite. Now, if you use an isolate for that, because it digests faster, uh, you may have more of an appetite than if you were to consume concentrates or casein, okay? So people who are trying to lose weight or trying to replace meals or trying to curb the appetite, you, you get those little munchies at night, concentrates and casein are the best way to go because they sustain your appetite for longer periods as opposed to weight protein isolate, okay? So, as discussed with the isolate concentrate and casein, those are the breakdowns of the different types of protein you can get. 80% uh, of the market for the protein powder are using concentrates and caseins and isolates mixed. That's what we consider a blend, okay? So if you ever go on a stocking show and says, oh, you know, are you after a blend or an isolate? That's usually what they're referring to, okay? Like I said, having, for, for the purpose of weight loss or fat loss, there's really not much difference between choosing the two, but it comes out to functionality. Like if you want to, have something after workout, uh, really, really quick, fast absorbing because you know you get home, your wife's cooking dinner, or husband's cooking dinner, and you're thinking, oh, you know, I better not have something, I better not have something too heavy because it could be something really delicious tonight. So I'll have a weight isolate. Okay, so the, by, by the time you get home, if it's an hour, an hour and a half later, um, it would have all broken down and been absorbed into your blood. Okay, um, cost. Isolates are generally more expensive. Okay, uh, the reason why is because for it to get to the state that we, where it breaks down pretty quickly, it has to be um, it has to be processed from concentrate. So how it works is that, as we all know, all protein comes from milk. Uh, to get whey protein, we have they have to break down or break apart the cheese uh, from the milk, and that's that's basically a byproduct. So protein essentially is a byproduct of making cheese. Okay. With that protein is the blend, is the whey isolate, concentrate, and casein. Now, to get the isolate, they have to break apart what's known as the concentrate from the casein. And then from that concentrate is when they break apart even further to get the isolate. So it requires two or three levels of, um, uh, I guess, breakdown from the initial milk where it comes from. And that's why it's a little bit more costly because it requires more uh, more work to get, to get to the isolate, okay? Concentrates and casein, not so much, you know, they sometimes Come as a raw product, uh, not much, not much done to it. Add a bit of flavoring, a bit of thickener, and voila, you've got your really nice tasting, uh, tasting concentrate or casein. Okay, so generally casein and concentrate will cost uh, a lot cheaper, um, but that never ever diminishes the fact that they are just as good in terms of uh, building muscle or weight loss as isolate. Okay. Um, the third thing to, I guess, sort of uh, look for in a protein is the protein percentage. It's very easy to figure out. You want to break down the protein per 100 grams. So if you find, usually American labels don't do this, but some do, um, is you divide um, the protein per serving to the serving size. So let's just say I got a 40 gram serve, 
and per 40 grams, I get 30 grams of protein. You want to divide the serving, the, uh, the protein serving uh, to the serving size. Now I'll get you the protein percentage. Now, generally, we want to stick with anything that's higher than 70%. Okay? I'm not saying if it's 60 grams per 100, it's terrible protein. Uh, all I'm saying is you're paying for something that's 40% carbohydrates or 40% uh, what I call unknown substances. Okay? So I'm not saying the rest are going to be like harmful to you. It's just that you're not getting the maximum amount of protein per serving because um, there was a recent uh, statistics done on protein is that most, about 70 to 80% of the protein on the market these days will generally sit above 70 grams per 100. So there's really no reason to find a protein on the market that's below 60 grams because that's, uh, in my opinion, in this day and age, it's very subpar. Okay, it's probably made in Mexico somewhere or something like that, but we don't want, we definitely, definitely don't want anything um, lower than seven, like you can, you can do 65, 68. If it tastes amazing, if it's, pro, it's a protein that tastes normally good, it's the only one you ever drink and it sits around 65, 68, um, yes, that can be an exception, but most proteins that taste normally good will always be above 70 grams. So that's one thing to look for. Make sure you're getting your, your bang for your buck. Make sure it's over, over at least 70 grams of protein. Um, it breaks down easy, digests well, uh, tastes good. So those are the, those are the factors. Um, often or not, you would generally find anything between one to two kilos for around 60 to 80 bucks. Okay, so that's the price you're supposed to pay. So if you ever come across something that's one kilo and it's looking to charge you $9, please come see me. <laughs> okay, so. That's, that's the gist of whey protein. There are sort of ver other variants, you know, so people these days are doing um, vegan protein, which is this one here. Uh, are they superior? Uh, in, some sen in some senses, yes and no, okay? What are the pros and cons between taking a vegan protein versus a whey protein? Well, one thing, vegan protein usually digests a lot easier. It doesn't give you as much, uh, some of the digestive issues that whey protein offers. But that being said, about 95% of the population has no problem, problem digesting whey protein at all. Um, vegan protein generally is more expensive than whey protein. It's just that the, the economics of it haven't, kept, haven't caught up to the, um, to the whey industry because there's just not as much people consuming vegan protein. And one of the other factors too is taste. You're going to get this real gritty kind of, uh, if you guys ever had beef grass or anything with barley in it, it's going to this really kind of gritty texture to it, which not many people like. Okay, so the other thing is taste. So if you ever have issues digesting whey isolates, hydrolyzed whey isolates, or anything that's whey that has uh, that is derived from dairy and still have issues digesting it, or it's giving you too much reflux or problems digesting, uh, vegan protein are a very viable choice. Now they're coming out with all these um, variants to it. You know, it's got hemp protein, it's got sasha uh, extract, it's got um, Soy, brown rice, egg almond, they're coming with all sorts of, uh, I guess, non dairy alternatives. There's even collagen based ones, okay? Um, they're all just as viable in terms of losing weight and building muscle because they all contain amino acids, okay? Um, so that's it with the protein. Uh, now, on to amino acids. As I said before, with the protein powder, they break down into amino, what we call uh, branch chain um, essential and non essential amino acids. That's what we use to recover and fuel our bodies, uh, to grow our hair, to strengthen our bones, to you know, basically nutrients our organs, um, everything. Okay, this is usually uh, comes in a form of branch chain amino acid. There are ones are more complete branch chain and essential, but about eight percent of the market will usually just be branch chain amino acids alone. Okay, now the idea of branch chain amino acids is that it offers you recovery without the calorific cost of a protein. Because if you consume a whey protein powder, you generally be giving up anywhere between 100 to 150 calories per serving. Now, Revive or any sort of amino acid that you take during training will half that. Like the serving of this one will give you generally between 60 to 70 calories per serving, okay? But it will give you eight grams of BCA. So that's usually double the amount of recovery you would expect from protein with more than half the amount of calories lost. Okay, so people who are dieting um, and are very strict with their calories or have very little calories to spare, let's just say 
I'm only going to give you a thousand calories per day. You'd be like, oh, geez, you know, that's a third of my caloric intake gone for the day. You know, um, I got I got a really sweet sushi tonight. Uh, I want something sweet to sort of curb my appetite. This is a very viable choice because a it tastes like cordial, it tastes like it's got a bunch of sugar in it, but it doesn't. Okay, it's zero sugar. Um, it's got 60 calories per serving, but then again, all, every 60 calories in that is used for recovery. So it's a very nutritionally dense 60 calories, okay? Um, and at the same time, like I said, it has vitamin C, it has vitamin E in it, so it's very good for immune system as well as recovery. Not all BCAAs are made the same. Some have different properties, like there's one thing that I saw that's, that have electrolytes. So it's people who are doing a combination of resistance training as well as anaerobic training, um, and you sweat a lot, you know, that's, that might be a really good choice for you to combine electrolytes with bad chain amino acids. But this, this is not 100% um, a must take, especially when you're training. But if you find that you are consuming an adequate amount of protein per day, and you're still getting consistently sore, or you find that you're, recover you're not recovering fast enough, or if you're training for a specific event, then this is a very, very good option to take because, um, if you are if you are consuming adequate or large amount of protein, it just means that your body's not converting uh, the protein to amino acids sufficiently enough. Whereas this will deliver straight amino acids to your blood, and you get a far better recovery out of it. Okay, um, so it's not 100% necessary to take. Um, I would first definitely, if you ask yourself, uh, should I take amino acids? Look at your protein intake per day. Is it adequate enough? Uh, make sure that's 100% um, adequate before looking at amino acids. Uh, because this can be simply as fast as you just consume an extra one or two meals or an extra 60 grams of protein per day and press them. You've got your egg added extra recovery. Okay. Uh, third thing on our list, fat burners. How do they work? Okay. Um, they work pretty much the same way if you were to um, cut calories out of your diet, so create a calorie deficit, or exercise more, which is the same thing, creating calorie deficit. Now, Fat burners generally increase your metabolic, your base metabolic rate higher, higher than normal for a short period of time. So obviously if you take a fat burner at, on, at the beginning of the week on Monday, and you say, I'm gonna lose 20 kilos by Sunday, it doesn't generally work like that, okay? So let's just give it a number, like um, anywhere between two to 300 calories a day, you will generally lose if you, if you took a pretty strong, uh, pretty strong fat burner. The idea that it's to raise your metabolic rate so you can you your body burns more calories than normal. Okay? For someone, let's just say someone who is on very limited calories, is tired, weight's not budging, they've got a weighing coming up, um, and that's a good alternative. You know, if you want to use a fat burner for a short period of time, increases metabolic rate, gives them a lot of energy, um, and allows them to drop those extra kilos or extra weight to reach their goals. Okay. I, I'm generally not a fan of fat burners simply because, well, in terms of long-term results, because it doesn't teach good eating habits. I mean, you, if you give you something that's gen that generally gives you a short period, of, short results over a short period of time, I don't see that as a long-term solution because ultimately, if you want to create a calorie deficit, you have to train right, you have to eat right, um, and that in itself will give you the results. But let's just say if you don't really eat well, you know, you don't really eat the right things and you, you skip training sessions and you take the fat burner and say, oh great, I'm losing two or three kilos, you know, I've got some more results. Um, let's take that out of the equation. Let's just say I run out of fat burners the next day. I'm all sold out, okay? Um, and you need to reach those results again for like a wedding or a photo shoot or whatever. Um, and you come to someone, I don't have any fat burners. What are you gonna do? Okay, you can't create that calorie deficit anymore. So they're only there if Let's just say, like I said, uh, if you can't cut any more calories from your food, you've got a pretty intense training session, um, and you want to lose weight for a short period of time, or you just want long-term energy throughout the day. That's the difference between fat burners and pre-workout too. The fat burners tend to give you um, a longer-lasting energy throughout the day as opposed to your pre-workout. Okay, some of them heat you up as well. It gives you it gives you this feel like you've consumed a bit of a Thai chili, you know, uh, for a long period of time. So that's a thermogenic effect. Okay. But generally, yes, they're, they're good in certain circumstances. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily extreme, but if you have the right context, if you're using them in the right context, they yield good results. But I definitely do not recommend them in the long term. So it's not something that you want to use month after month after month. 
okay? It should be used to sort of either get you back into the swing of training, to lose a bit of kilograms, you know, short term, and then you should be back onto the diet, okay? Uh, the last thing I have is the pre-workout, okay? Uh, like I said before, the difference between your pre-workouts and your fat burners is the length of time that it stays in your body. The other difference too is that the pre-workouts offer what I call um, a physical advantage or a physical boost, okay? Because all stimulants give you a mental boost, but if they provide certain amino acids like um, arginine, uh, some of them will carry histamine, yeah, I think that's how it's pronounced. Uh, the main one you guys have heard of is the beta alanine, it's got creatine in it. All these things enhance things like uh, muscular endurance. So things like, um, things for getting rid of lactic acid, uh, things enhancing power, strength, mental focus, stamina, okay? So these ones give you a physical edge in terms of um, any sort of uh, time-based or repetition-based training, so excellent for CrossFit. Um, there are ones which focus more on, I, I guess, bodybuilding, which enhances properties like uh, muscle hypertrophy, um, uh, muscle volume, that sort of stuff, like getting as much volume into the muscle as quickly as possible for fewest amount of reps. Those aren't very ideal for, I guess, functional training because the more hypertrophy you get, the more lactic acid you're going to build and the quicker it, it slows you down, okay? So best thing to do when you guys are looking for a pre-workout, always ask the people in the store, always tell them what kind of training you're doing because it can backfire, you know? You can have something like, um, you can have a product that gives you a huge amount of hypertrophy and you've got a 10 mile run the next day. The next thing you know, your legs are swollen up to the size of a balloon and you've got lactic acid within the first five minutes. So terrible. But there are ones that are very, very good for um, muscle endurance or like uh, long-term anaerobic events. You know, if you have ones that will enhance endurance, give you an extra half an hour run time, uh, increase cardiovascular fitness, increase more oxygen into the blood things like that, that don't enhance muscle hypertrophy. In fact, we'll do the opposite. We'll actually um, uh, get rid of lactic acid or um, deal with a good percentage of it as you're exercising or training, okay? Um, last thing I have here is teas. I will be handing this out for free. So if anyone who wants green tea can come and grab some. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've seen these out in the market. Um, I have to say this, green tea, does not make you lose weight, okay? Um, they, don't, they don't really aid in weight or fat loss as much as people think. And the reason why is green tea, at the end of the day, is more of a diuretic than a metabolic booster. There is resveratrol extract in this, which helps with like um, mental brain function, energy, that sort of stuff. But you could drink this entire packet here. I can break every sachet into a cup, make you drink it all at once, and your weight will not rise. Okay? At the end of the day, it's more of a diuretic. Um, why do some people swear by it? Well, it's, it's a simple thing with uh, diuretics is that they do make you lose a fair bit of water weight quite quickly. So some people who are very, you know, have very poor water intake throughout the day and they start using this one maybe two, up to two or three times a day, uh, thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to get good results, and then lose a bit of water. I'm thinking, oh, look, I'm looking a little bit tighter, but that's just water weight. It hasn't, your body fat percentage has not by zero. <laughs> so for some people who want to lose, a, like, a, I guess they're getting a bit of water retention, you know, coming off a flight, want a bit of energy, want a bit of mental focus, this would be great. But by no means, they, they are not going to make you lose any weight at all and not going to boost metabolic weight, okay? Um, but they're free to take today. <laughs> Probably won't get any takers after <laughs> after saying that, but I have to set the record straight. We we do with only factual things here, so anything that's been researched and proven with clinical studies, um, we generally tend tend to advise people with. So anything that's kind of in the realm of uh, hearsay or we consider it, we call it bro science, we don't really deal with those sort of things. Um, but yeah, that being said, uh, if you guys have any questions at all, so now it's time for the Q and A part. Any questions, as obscure as, as it is, I'll be able to answer. Yes? So, typically, as a gym, you work out. So, when's the best time to take protein? Yep. To blow you too much? Yep. 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 Um, with with the protein uh, in that sort of context, yep. 
um, for, for the function of recovery or just simply having protein after oh. recovery. So that being said, we've got two things here for recovery, the protein and the aminos. Now that taken into context, it's not absolutely necessary to have your protein straight after workout, okay? Let's just say uh, dinner's pushed ahead of schedule. You can have your amino acids here instead of your protein for recovery because they both do the same thing. The difference is, like I said, this one will offer you as much recovery, if not more so, than the protein, but offer far fewer calories, so it's almost minimal bloating. Okay, so you could drink this and eat within half an hour, or some people actually drink this while they're eating their dinner. So it's going to give you the same amount of recovery as the protein, um, but with almost equal, more than less than half the amount of calories. Okay, so the answer to your question, should, what kind of protein should I take? The answer is none. You can take the amino acids instead because um, in terms of functionality, it's far better for what you're using it for. Now, I guess to counteract the problem, okay, if I don't have protein after training, that's not going to hit my protein requirements for the day. Uh, you can have the protein during the day, okay? We, when we work with micro and macronutrients, we usually calculate it at the end of the day. I mean, it's obviously not ideal to have 150 grams of protein all in one hit. I mean, you want to spread that across three, four meals a day, but we generally work with uh, what's tallied at the end of the day. So let's just say you would, you know, you're designated to drink four liters. Mark said, oh, again, you've got you to drink your four liters of water a day. Um, you don't want to drink that all at once, but as long as you hit that target at the end of the day, you generally pretty, you consider it pretty healthy, pretty well hydrated. Okay, so it's sort of similar concept with protein is that you don't really need to have it at a specific time if it's inconvenient for you because you know if you're going to go into a meeting and you know a protein shake, shake, uh, um, protein shake makes you fart like crazy, you have a lot of people that come from you know Bella Vista who goes into business meetings with um, people from overseas and they say, oh, you know, if I, if I drink my, my standard protein, I digest it well, but I'm farting like crazy and it stinks. So that's the last thing you want is to have a protein shake. I say, but it's, like, it's the only time that's convenient because I finished training and I want to go after a meeting. <laughs> Okay, you don't have to. You don't have to. You can go in that meeting drinking one of these. It's going to give you the same amount of recovery, but it's not going to make you stink up the room and do that million dollar deal that you're, going to, that you're pitching for. So definitely, um, I guess, use it in context. If, you, if, you, if you're missing out that 30 grams of protein after workout and you're only going to get a certain amount, you can take the shake before bed. It will work. You will get the same amount of recovery um, and you feel just the same the next morning. Okay? Uh, it answers your question. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I actually get um, a lot of people tell me that that when they have a casein, something specific, not too heavy, but something that they um, their body sort of digesting before bed, um, they find it easier to, uh, to sleep. I've actually had a look into it. There's actually no science backing up how protein helps you sleep. So there's no correlation to that. So that's that's still a little bit unknown. So I, I don't want people to get the wrong idea taking protein helps you sleep. But there's something there's something there. There's definitely something there. So you're not the first person who said so. Um, yeah, yeah. Some people have like mad cravings at night and they find they can't go to bed because of it, but I, that could be it. It could be just balance your ghrelin, ghrelin levels. Ghrelin is like a hormone um, in control of your appetite. Um, and your hunger cravings, you could be just be satisfying that and going away and letting you sleep. So it could be as simple as that. Um, yes, you can have it um, before bed. I've known guys to mix up a protein shake, pull it next to the toilet, and during the night when they wake up to go to the toilet, there it is. So I've known people to do that. Obviously, bodybuilders who need a huge amount of requirements of protein per day and they find that I'm eating eight meals a day, and they cannot fit another shake in between, hang on, I get up in the, in the evening to go pee. So you know what? Right next to the toilet bowl is where it's going to go. Okay? So yes, the theory of taking protein any time of day is absolutely true to its form. You can have it in the morning, you can have it while you dry, you can have it at home. It does not necessarily need to be specifically after training. All, our, all, the, all the theories and all the studies lead to is that after training, it's more efficient because there's a spot of um, uh, there's a spot of need for muscle glucose and usually a faster breakdown rate of nutrients uh, because you've offset your blood sugar levels after an intense session. So generally, that's a good time to have some sort of recovery formula. It doesn't and it doesn't necessarily need to be protein. 
Um, the only thing I would say post-workout um, is to look for forms of amino acids to ingest quite quickly. Um, a little bit of glucose to bounce your blood sugar level back to normal um, and get the water back in. And a bit of sweat at that least a good half a liter of sweat during workouts, and especially with uh, Mark and Steph, maybe more, maybe a liter, a liter and a half. Um, yeah, get your, get your water back in, uh, get some magnesium potassium if you can. Uh, primary thing is your amino acids because they help you recover fast. Um, and also a little bit of uh, glucose doesn't hurt because it helps out blood sugar. Okay, so I think that answers your question. Is there any other ones? Yeah. One is that the ideal person of carry the weight in terms of things. Yeah. Why not cool, food? Cool, cool food. In, in the perfect world, in the ideal world, in Peter's utopia, I know this is going to sound contradictory to what I'm doing, but I want you to be eating. 100% food to 0% supplements. That's the perfect world, okay? But that doesn't exist because we all work eight to 10 hours a day. We don't have the, um, the logistics to produce three, four, you know, homemade meals and take them to work. So realistically speaking, a good ratio would be, um, I would say maximum amount of shakes should reflect the maximum amount of meals. So if you're having three meals a day, you should be having no more than two shakes. If you're having two meals a day, you should be having no more than two shakes. Okay, so one to one. Um, but I would say aim for zero. Okay, um, if you are eating quite well, if you're having four to five meals a day and you're having one shake, that's a good balance. I still have shakes a day because my, my body cannot physically digest five to six meals a day. Okay, because I find my body's just like, okay, um, I'm eating enough food. Um, I don't want to digest anymore. You know, my my stomach is a bit pregnant. You know, there's just too much food going into my mouth. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to have a shake in that regard, um, so that my body's not constantly um, breaking down solids. It's got a it's got a liquid in between, so it gives it a little bit of a break, and it does it does help streamline your stomach a little bit. So if you find that you're getting way too close with solid foods throughout the day, you can only eat a salad and a chicken, and you find oh, that gross the craziness out of me. Um, you know, you can break that up by having your shake, and you know your your, your stomach does definitely not come out to you when you're having your shake. It's only 150 calories. Okay, so best case scenario, you're going 100 to zero because you know it means you're having a 100% whole food diet, and that's the ideal. But it's just not it's not realistic in this day and age. So I would say one or two shakes a day if you can get your diet um, on track. Okay, so that's that's the good thing. But everyone's different, you know. You I have truck drivers that come in and say, oh, you know what? I drive so much throughout the day. Like I I start work in the morning and I only have a break around midday. So how can I get around that? I need to have some sort of meal or some sort of sustenance in between my morning start and my midday break. And I said, well, shake will do that for you because you can't physically get to food. Um, and then what about my afternoon, you know, between my midday actual meal and the time I drop off work? Um, I need something between that, between that time as well. So all those shakes would do that. So there are circumstances um, where you might have to have more shakes than you need because of your work or your schedule or whatever it is, okay? Because for a truckie, a shake is far better than, for example, going to Macca's or um, having easy takeaway. Um, it just blows their macros way out of proportion and they just can't get the results. Okay, so hopefully that helps. Um, yep. Uh, and then question which is about the idea of the amino and Okay, so I'm glad you asked that. Um, there's a lot of amino acids, they all fall under amino acids, but they uh, list them as different types. Uh, so your creatine and glutamine fall under essential and non-essential. Now, the difference between glutamine and creatine, glutamine is designed for recovery and general health, and creatine is designed for performance. Now, we all have creatine in our bodies, but they're varying amounts. Um, I'm going to take Usain Bolt, for example. He would generally, in his blood, have about two to three times more creatine than the average person. Uh, average person that trains, okay? Uh, higher creatine levels means higher adenosine triphosphate conversion, which means his body can convert a larger amount of muscle glucose or stored muscle energy to kinetic energy, which means um, if I was to 
off the starting block, he is far more explosive than anyone else on the planet. So Preeti's got a lot more to do with explosiveness and strength than endurance and anaerobic fitness. If anything, if you're taking, if you're very high dosed on creatine, your anaerobic and long-term um, anaerobic uh, capacity is going to get uh, diminished, is going to be in trouble. So generally, I do not recommend creatine for, for someone who's like a um, triathlete, uh, someone who does eight-hour bike rides. Uh, but for anyone doing a, any sort of explosive training, or off the block sprinters, power lifters, um, Olympic weightlifters are a very good example because they're very explosive off the block. Just one lift, they need huge amounts of creatine for that. So basically, creatine uh, enhances um, a component in the body called ATP, and that governs the conversion of stored energy within the muscles to kinetic energy. So the more creatine you have, um, the more energy you can convert to your lifts in a shorter period of time. So that's what creatine does. Glutamine helps with the immune system and gut health. So glutamine, what I would consider is a sacrificial amino. Um, I mean, there are studies on it uh, shown to help with like Crohn's disease and that stuff because it's, it's got such good uh, gut health properties and immune system properties. Um, but the thing with glutamine is you need to use a fairly large amount of it. Um, my prescribed dose, well, the, the TGA prescribed dose is 15 grams per day. Uh, my prescribed is anywhere between 20 to 25. I like to high dose it because, uh, especially if you're training, glutamine is the first amino acid that breaks down. So let's just say if you go on a caloric deficit and your muscles are trying to break itself down into back into amino acids, um, glutamine is the first thing you target. It becomes like a sacrificial amino. So the more glutamine you have, um, the less likely your muscles are going to go um, catabolic um, and the lower chance of you um, your immune system slipping. Okay, so glutamine is more for recovery, general health. Creatine, excellent for performance. Um, and I'll go one step, one step further. What's the prescribed dose of creatine per day? Anywhere between three to five is enough. Um, there, are low, there are people that say, oh, you need to load, load in your creatine. In, in creatine. Uh, you go three, three to four times the recommended dose. You do that for about five days, and your body tends to accept creatine a lot more readily after that. But the thing is, is that once you use it for two weeks at a maintenance dose, which is three to five grams a day, uh, it will automatically absorb. Okay. So anyone looking for edge in training, trying to become more explosive, a little bit more powerful, uh, creatine to go. No, it's not going to make you muscly. Uh, being muscly is a byproduct of your training. So people who take creatine become more explosive, more stronger. Uh, they lift heavier weights or become more explosive the weights, the muscle become, becomes more toned. That's the appearance of muscle gain or size that's associated with creatine. Creatine doesn't help you put on size. Creatine doesn't make you massive. Creatine doesn't make you grow hair. It's simply for performance, explosive lifts, and more power in your, lift, in your, in your training, whether, whether it's body weight or weight. Last question. Yeah. Are oh, the BCAAs? What's the difference between that and the BCAAs? So the BCAAs it falls on a similar category of glutamine. It's designed for muscle recovery. Now, the three main BCAAs you're going to come across is your leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Um, a good thing to look out for in your BCAA is if you guys ever buy BCAAs on the market and you shake it up, it's going to have these little white particles on the top. That's the leucine. Leucine takes about five to ten more minutes than the isoleucine and valine to dissolve. So the more white particles you see, the better it is. So some people have come back and said, oh, you know, um, your, the BCAs are terrible. There's all these white stuff that doesn't dissolve. I said, yeah, that's the leucine. The more you see of it, the better it is for you. The, the, the far better recovery you're going to get. Um, usually they come in a standard 2 one ratio, but I've seen ones that are about 8 eight one one It means a higher leucine ratio. So the higher the ratio, the more expensive it becomes because leucine is the more expo expensive component of the band chain amino acids. Okay. Um, you're going to get BCAs in everything you consume. Eggs. Chicken, steak, fish, uh, generally things that um, I would say more red blooded would have high amounts of branched amino acids. So, for example, steak and eggs usually rank the highest in terms of uh, branched amino acid content. Um, salmon's pretty good too. You're going to find branched amino acids in all protein. Dissolve into the liquid, yeah. Could be a little bit of a problem, like dropping out the liquid into the 
Yep. Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, one one catch with branch chain amino acids is that uh, biologically they form um, they form they tend to cultivate bacteria faster than their protein because they're in the they're in their raw form. Like branch chain amino acids tend to accumulate and cultivate bacteria much faster, at least four times faster than protein. Um, and how they do that is they, they start to come up with these little blockages in the shaker. So if you have a shaker and you, and that's dedicated towards amino acids only, um, and you start to see little uh, black blockages in the shaker, I would start to throw that. It's not going to make you sick, but I'll definitely start throwing it out because it means you cannot get rid of the smell anymore, which means the bacteria is pleasant in the plastic. Okay, that's one thing we can't we can't avoid. It's one of the, I guess, nature's cons of having you know a raw form of amino acid like that. Protein won't do that. Protein will just make the shaker stink altogether. Um, when should I replace my shaker? Like I said, if you see physical signs like that, um, you can boil it, but chances are it's probably going to come back. I would say if you have um, a couple of shakers at home, I would say use one dedicated towards amino acids alone and the other towards the protein. Generally, if you're using a protein, um, protein shaker, it would last a lot longer than a dehydrated shaker. Um, but since we have such a good relationship with uh, Mark and Steph, just say that you're from high reps and I'll give you a free shaker. <laughs> It's fine. You want a pink lid? You want a pink? I'll I'll give you this one after tonight. How about that? Okay, but um, yes, like I mean, we go for our shakers. It's just a necessity. Um, it's just part of training. Um, and I I encourage you to not use the same shaker for more than six months. Okay, that's just like this is like gross. Okay. Uh, yep. This one. Sorry. Oh, for cooking or for heating the liquid up? It, it will not change the composition of the protein unless it goes over 100 degrees, which uh, tends to damage some of the, the amino acids, some of the non-essential and essential amino acids, which um, it's, it's kind of like if you look at eggs, um, and some people say, oh, I'm going to cook it the French way, which leave it uh, with the yolk runny. It preserves a lot of the arginine in the yolk, which is very good for... Um, what was it? I think it was uh, cholesterol. Uh, so arginine is very good at reducing cholesterol. But once you cook the egg yolk straight through, um, most of the arginine gets destroyed because it's very temperamental. Um, <laughs> there are some amino acids in protein that are like that. But if you if you don't use boiling water, you'll retain about 99% of its composition. Okay. I've done that before. I've done like uh, like a hot chocolate, but I use protein powder instead. It's fine as long as you're not using like crazy boiling water. It's hundred percent fine. In terms of cooking, um, it's unavoidable because anything you bake with uh, anything you bake is is automatically going to go over hundred degrees. So yes, if you cook pancakes, make muffins, make cakes or whatever with it, uh, you are going to lose a certain percentage of it. Not the actual protein, but the amino acid uh, integrity. So the protein is going to remain the same, but you're just going to get less amino acids from it. Okay, hopefully that answers that. Yeah, you won't lose all of it. You'll lose like, I don't know, um, I've gone off the top of my head, about 33%. So you retain most of the protein integrity. Okay, um, any other questions? Any other questions? Uh, yes. Yes, um, with the protein shakes, uh, it comes down to two things. So some people are using uh, different types of protein. So we call fat burning protein. So ones that can, that um, are deliberately containing like fat burners in it. So for example, we sell a protein called Lipofy. Now that contains about 35 milligrams of caffeine and about 15 to 20 milligrams of green tea extract. So if you're super sensitive to caffeine and you consume that and 30 milligrams is enough to keep you awake, then yes, that can happen. But general protein, um, the studies done on that, there's nothing um, in whey blends that I can see that will keep you up away, um, keep you up at night. But you might have that freak gene in you that is very sensitive to, for example, arginine. A certain protein might contain arginine, or you might be sensitive to um, uh, one of the amino acids responsible for brain function. Okay, because it contains a varied amount of amino acids. Um, it means it's very inclusive, it has every amino acid in it. Um, 
But that's not to say that it's the sole response. It's solely responsible for keeping up the weight. Um, it will generally be due to an outside factor. Like if it, it was, it had caffeine in it, or it had nootropic in it, or it had some fat burners in it, um, or it could be from something before. Okay. So sometimes you just got to be very vigilant and look, looking at the label, making sure you're just you're just buying a blend, not something that has like um, that has like caffeine or guarana or coffee extract in it. Uh, because it may not necessarily contain uh, coffee or caffeine, but guarana in some cases can be twice as potent. Okay, short term, short term, it's not very long term, it's probably safer long term for you, guarana, but short term, no, it's definitely going to keep you awake. So, yeah, any, you just, you just have to look at the label, and if it says, if it indicates any sort of weight loss or fat burn, um, automatically I'll assume it's got some form of stimulants in it. Um, they do that just to sort of boost the metabolic rate, but usually it's not strong enough. Like that, then if you get any sort of effect out of it, it probably lasts half an hour, forty minutes at tops, and then it will go away because they don't they don't put a full dose in it because they take into consideration that you are going to use a protein in the safety number two three times a day. But if every single serving had a hundred milligrams of caffeine, you're going to be off your head by the third serving. Okay, hopefully that helps. Okay, uh, any other questions before we uh, wrap up? Uh, these are all available to try tonight, so I encourage you, I encourage everyone to come in and have a shot, <laughs> have a drink, try it. <laughs> we, we have a store in Castle Hill. Um, I'm going to work something out with Steph and Mark to to give you guys some sort of a discount in store, like a, like a high reps only, members only discount. By just mentioning the name, um, I'm gonna set I'm gonna set an account up for you, uh, for them, and um, yeah, I'm in the process at the moment, but we're gonna do something soon. Yeah, so you can see like screenshots like you will buy, like you don't get Yeah, like you know, in your like. We do, we do um, what we call prescribed dosing. So for um, someone who's new coming in, saying, oh, you know what, protein and amino acids want to enhance my results. Um, we prescribe the doses, how much to take, when to take it, how much water you want to mix with it, um, where to store it, everything. We basically go down and write an entire prescribed program of supplementation um, and how to take it. So we answer more questions in. Um, some of the more elusive questions are specifically towards your program. Okay, so everything's catered, nothing's like a one size fits all. Okay, so bigger person, you prescribe a bigger dose, smaller person, smaller dose. Um, oh, I can't take, like, for example, you can't take a shake straight after training. Okay, that would be something that's catered only specifically for you, but some others, some people have the same problem, then we're going to do the same thing as well. Okay, um, like I said, we have more, this is only a, a fraction of our, um, of our sampling staff, so we have a lot more installed sample. Um, so if you want to try any other flavors, I mean the Revive itself comes in I think six or seven flavors. Uh, we have about three or four of them in store to try. So it's like raspberry, pineapple, there is grape as well, one of my more popular flavors. Um, and they're all free to try. I mean try it, like it, it's great. If you don't, you pick another flavor. Uh, but we just keep working until you're satisfied with the flavors that you're getting and um, you're happy with the results. Okay. Awesome, is there any other questions? Awesome, so yeah, they're free to try. Um, thank, thank you guys so much for your time tonight. Uh, I look forward to doing more of these in the future. And like I said, if you have any questions at all, um, feel free to call our store. We're open from nine to six every day. You can speak to any one of our staff, ask them any questions. Um, like I said, you can, if you're in the area, swing past, have a try, have a drink, it's on the house. Um, and uh, we'll definitely be doing more of these in the future for you guys. Um, but yes, if you have time, come in and give our samples a try tonight. And uh, hopefully, maybe we can get a photo. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Thank you. Stock up the shakers. Is that good? 150 members? Yeah. <laughs> we have enough. We have enough.